Okay. Um, so we know that uh, when we looked at, um, uh, um, you know, these these are uh, the top uh, journals uh, within uh, Medline. They're not quite an abridged index, but they are the uh, the top journals across the board. Um, when we looked in 2001, we noted that only about 20% of these journals um, uh, endorsed a consort. Um, uh, five years later, it was up uh, quite a bit. Uh, again, these journals um, have a little bit of variation because some of them, based on impact factor, change. But by and large, there's substantial overlap. And then when we looked more recently in 2012, we see that in endorsement among these journals is, is up almost to 60%. So it's encouraging, uh, but it's awfully slow. And there are many reasons for that. And I cannot uh, get into those uh, today. Um, I think I will leave that. Uh, I've sort of um, explained as much as I want to explain um, about this. Um, we did a systematic review asking, is, is journal endorsement of reporting guidelines effective? And that's uh, published in, in the CDSR as the um, Cochrane Database of Systematic Reviews. And um, uh, what we found is that, indeed, um, uh, for journals that do endorse the consort statement, um, there does appear to be improvements in the completeness of a reporting. So that's in, encouraging. And uh, here is an example of um, one item that we looked at in the consort statement is allocation concealment, a fundamental part of the randomization process. And we see um, when we uh, compare uh, endorsing journals to non-endorsing journals, that there is really a, a substantial um, increase in, in the completeness of reporting. And, and so that's, that's very encouraging. But um, I, I think that absolute result um, really has to be taken in some perspective. Because what we see is, even within endorsing journals, less than 50% of uh, trial reports have allocation concealment that is adequately reported. And given the uniqueness of allocation concealment and sequence generation uh, to the whole randomization process, that should be as close to 100% as possible. So while we see improvements in, in journals that endorse the consort statement in terms of uh, trial reports are more completely reported. We we have still a lot of work uh, ahead of ourselves. Here is all, all um, uh, 25 items of the consort uh, statement. So we see that um, uh, those uh, journals that endorse the consort statement, that there is more complete reporting. And I think that's a, an encouraging result, but it's certainly not um, as good as we need to get. We also looked at um, whether um, journal endorsement uh, of uh, other reporting guidelines, sort of non-consort reporting guidelines, whether it improves and completes the reporting. And we recently published this and uh, I think one of the uh, interesting stories here is that few reporting guidelines appear to be evaluated. And so we need to uh, obviously improve that situation. So for example, you wouldn't bring a drug or a device to market, certainly not a drug. I think devices are somewhat uh, uh, under different regulations, at least in Canada and the United States. You wouldn't bring a drug to market without evaluating it. And yet we see here a large number of reporting guidelines in a sense being brought to market um, without uh, being evaluated. And so we, we need to uh, improve that situation. 
what we did see is that in, in, in there are very few studies here, I want to emphasize that, but we did see some uh, improvement in, in the completeness of reporting systematic reviews in, in journals that endorsed the PRISMA statement. Now, I did mention earlier that um, um, many of you um, will be doing clinical research, but I think probably almost all of you who are listening uh, will be doing peer review. And so here's just an example of how a reporting guideline can be used effectively as part of the peer review process. Eric Kobo uh, reported on a lovely trial where he showed that um, the additional use of a checklist during the peer review process improved the uh, uh, overall quality of reporting of the subsequent publication. So I would encourage everybody to think about using a, a reporting guideline checklist uh, when they are peer reviewing uh, articles. And just to remind you that um, there are well over 200 reporting guidelines. So it's likely possible that you will be able to find a checklist for the um, article that you have under review. And I'm going to um, spend just a, a couple of uh, slides here um, in, in to, uh, about endorsement um, and implementation of reporting guidelines. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complex issue. And it's not simply a matter of sort of saying to an author, um, use a reporting guideline. It really has to be that uh, the journal have to endorse the use of reporting guideline. They have to also implement how will they use uh, reporting guidelines? How will they make demands uh, of uh, prospective uh, authors? So simply asking authors to populate a checklist will, will not likely do the trick. And um, that said, it, asking them to populate a checklist will be an important part. And we need also journals to use sort of standard, clear and unambiguous language uh, about um, endorsement. So for example, if a prospective author is reading instructions to authors, and the journal says that they encourage uh, authors to use a checklist. And that will give a different meaning than if a journal says they're requiring authors to use it. So what we need uh, uh, journals to do is, is to think about how they're going to endorse uh, reporting guidelines. And um, I'm going to end here uh, with a slide on um, sort of implementation. And so um, a, a journal can say whatever they want about endorsement, but if they don't monitor what in, uh, authors are doing, uh, then it will be an in, ineffective implementation. And if they don't require their peer reviewers to use checklists, again, it will impact implementation of uh, reporting guidelines. And we know that implementation varies across journals. And what we need to do as uh, reporting guideline developers is actually develop toolkits that can be used by uh, journal editors who wish to endorse and implement reporting guidelines in their journal. I think uh, that's uh, my last slide. And okay. I'm not sure whether that Greece. was sorry okay. hi, hi. <laughs> go ahead sandra oh great thank you so much david uh, that was such an insightful webinar and I, i'm sure um, all of our participants enjoyed it thoroughly um we have a couple of questions here from some of our participants i might sure. fire them at you if that's if that's okay yeah uh, uh, great. So um, just one here from uh, Professor Declan Devan. He would welcome your thoughts on multiple reporting guidelines on the same topics or issue and how this can be minimized. Okay, so um, that's um, a very, very insightful question. So um, I'm just uh, thinking um, 
So uh, th there are um, two developments. Um, one is we're trying to, uh, some colleagues in Paris are developing software that um, will sort of take all of the consort extensions and they will ask prospective authors sort of a bunch of screening questions and then they will almost spit out a personalized consort checklist depending on uh, what sort of study they're doing. Let's say they're doing a, you know, a, a, some sort of a cluster trial on harms. So they're, you know, you, you have two or three different, um, two, th two or three different examples. Um, I think uh, the other issue is that it is confusing, um, definitely confusion. Uh, I think of the example of the NIH recently produced a guidance um, on uh, preclinical, um, how to report preclinical research. And there are several items that overlap with the ARRIVE guidelines, which are also used uh, in the preclinical space. And I think that's going to be very confusing uh, to prospective mm -hmm. authors. Um, I think what uh, prospective authors could do practically is, is take one guidance and, and go with it. And if there are some unique characteristics from another reporting guideline, they may want to add that in, uh, add some of those items into the study that they're reporting. I do think that it would be very useful for authors to include that information in, in, a, in a letter to the uh, editor when you're submitting the, the manuscript. Mm -hmm. uh, I think letters to the editor uh, are a very underutilized resource uh, for prospective authors because it does help the editor. In, it, it informs he or she uh, about what the authors uh, have done in respect to a whole bunch of things and they could have a paragraph and saying, um, you know, we um, we uh, used uh, two different reporting guidelines uh, covering the same space to try to report this information. Great, excellent. And as Declan has commented there, that it's a potential for organic nature of reporting and guidelines to let them kind of um, develop and uh, develop themselves as well. Um, one other uh, query here from uh, Claudia Oblasser. I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly. Um, and uh, the comment that she has, uh, as a lot of researchers will share her frustration about trying to publish an article and having it rejected by two journals. Um, they said that it was methodologically sound and she did use the reporting guidelines. Um, however, her research was not deemed novel enough. So a bit of frustration there around not publishing research um, yeah. And sometimes it may not be the researcher's fault. <laughs> yes, uh, absolutely. Um, I, I think that um, getting rejections is uh, is as painful for an old fellow like me as it is for mm -hmm. someone earlier in their career. And it's even more painful when it, the rejection and the comments from the peer reviewers and or editors do not appear to make sense. Yeah. And I think that um, the that happens every day and un unfortunately um you know particularly with the, the the luxury journals they have an acceptance rate of you know somewhere around six to nine percent so the vast majority of what they're getting submitted is, is rejected uh it, it's painful um uh, you know my advice is to um uh, always to uh, take a glass of wine in the evening and wake up the following morning and, and go back and submit it somewhere else. Great. <laughs> Excellent advice. Um, David, I think that's about it, unless any, anyone else wants to jump in with any other questions before we finish up. Um, again, I want to sincerely thank you for such a fantastic webinar. And as you can see from the comments here coming in on Twitter and on the group chat here, that um, everyone seemed to really enjoy uh, the webinar and found it very interesting with uh, lots of ideas and links to further reading. Um, so I think we'll, we'll leave it at there, uh, David. Thank okay, you very well, much. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I, I hope that it was of some use and it was uh, really fun for me to do. Have a, have a great rest of the day. Thank you, David. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.